Yes, Ms. Polly. My Lord, my lady, I'm turning now to ground two and yes. ground four, and ever conscious of time. Yes. Uh, I um, uh, intend to take you to just a couple of very short parts of the authorities that are in my skeleton, but will invite you <coughs> to look at some of those authorities uh, subsequently. Um, dealing with uh, grounds two and four, both of them, of course, deal with the question of proportionality. Yes. And turning to paragraph 69 of my skeleton, um, <coughs> the classic approach to determining justification in, in well settled law requires the tribunal to adopt a structured approach to the following questions. <coughs> did, the did the treatment or policy pursue uh, a legitimate aim? Uh, was the treatment or policy appropriate or rationally connected to the objective? And was the treatment or policy reasonably necessary to accomplish that objective? Uh, and I'll take you to a couple of authority points, if necessary, shortly. And then question four, <coughs> sometimes expressed uh, uh, as part of question C, but uh, often these days it expressed as a separate question four, uh, which is uh, at 70, 70 and 71, which is in effect... Uh, uh, whether the treatment or policy strikes a fair balance between the need to accomplish the aim and the discriminatory effect on the individual. Uh, and, and ASTA Communities is well known. I simply set out there the references 28, 64 and 73 and would also invite the court uh, to uh, look at the reference in Boyers where it was applied in the employment context, although there are many cases in which that's been applied uh, in due course and subsequently. For present purposes, I intend to take the court just to two very short parts of those authorities. Uh, the first is um, uh, both of them uh, with regard to the balancing exercise and uh, my principal submission on uh, grounds two and four. Uh, taking the court first to Hardy and Hanson, uh, uh, and lax, which is at tab 15 of your authorities. And it's paragraph first thirty two um, thirty two E. I'm, I'm afraid I've having written these down separately, I managed to have just mislaid where I wrote them down. Look for the sidelines. The, the 32. Sorry, I've got it. I'm so sorry, I've got it now. So, paragraph 32E, which is on page 137, and uh, you can see there in the, in the middle of that paragraph, uh, about eight or nine lines down, it says the employer does not have to demonstrate uh, that no other proposal is possible. The employer has to show that the proposal in this case for full time appointment is justified objectively notwithstanding its discriminatory effect. Yes. Uh, and then at 30, uh, uh, at paragraph uh, 59, at page 142, and this is Lord Justice Gage, it's not sidelined, but it's uh, five lines down, six lines down, as Lord Justice Sedley pointed out in Allenby, uh, citing Hampson, justifiable requires an objective balance between the discriminatory effect of the condition on the employee and the reasonable needs of the employer. And so uh, starting there, uh, I, I'm going to... Uh, ground two had three sub-parts, uh, and I'm going to take them in a slightly different order. 
uh, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask the court first to consider the uh, failure to consider uh, the discriminatory effect on the individual. In other words, did the unfair treatment or policy strike a fair balance between the need to accomplish the aim and the discriminatory <coughs> effect on the claimant? Uh, and then I will take the court shortly through the other two failure to take into consideration other relevant factors and the elision of the legitimate aim of proportionality. But we say in respect of all of those that having adopted the wrong approach to causation under Section 51A and Section 19, the tribunal then compounded its error in respect of the proportionality exercise. And by analogy, and I'll simply give the court the reference and won't take you to it unless I have a chance at the end, paragraph 64 of Kenton which effectively says, can the court be confident, having gone wrong in the various uh, steps of the analysis for indirect discrimination uh, 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 through the proportionality exercise, can it be confident that the, court, that the tribunal would have reached that decision? And we say the answer is no. Um, and the measure, the, the, the discriminatory effect of the measure and the need to be undertaking, what, what is the measure? I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, my lord. I didn't quite the, catch you. The, ba the balancing exercise, as, yes. as you remind <coughs> us in in paragraph seventy, the balancing exercise requires the court to weigh the discriminatory effect of the measure and the needs of the undertaking. And what what is the measure? That is the the discriminatory effect of the the PCP and the and the and the um, uh, in this context the uh, uh, legitimate. Sorry, the, the the measure in this context. I'm so sorry. Uh, is um, the discriminatory effect of the PCP in Section 19 terms uh, against the discriminatory effect of the... the so it will depend where, what you're looking at. In Section 15, 1A terms... No, no sorry, sorry, Mr. Charlie, you misunderstood yeah. the question. On the facts of this case, what yeah. is the measure whose discriminatory effect we're looking at? Oh, it's the framework. It's the framework policy. I'm so sorry. My Lord, I'm clarifying. You did mean in this case. You're talking about in this case. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes, thank yeah, you very yeah. much. In, in, thank in, you very much. In our yes. case, you're, 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 yes. You're, yes. you're saying that the... the well, there's an issue as to whether there was a requirement for a PhD or to be on the pathway to a PhD, whatever that means. Is that, is that the measure that you're, the, you're the measure talking is about? The, the, it's, the measure is the framework, um, is the application of the framework. The framework either is that you had to have a PhD or be on the pathway to PhD and or, and or have research, not and or, and had a research criterion. Those are the criteria that we looked at. But the, so in this context, the measure is the, is the framework itself. So that the balancing exercise that had to be carried out... Um, but, but not the part of the framework that requires there to be a business case for the post. Is that what you're saying? So, so, sorry, my lady. That what the, I, 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 I've just, I was just referring to what the law requires, which is that there be a, a, a balancing exercise, a, an evaluation of the balance between uh, the need to, to accomplish the aim which the framework sets out, or which, which the framework is, is, set, it, is intended to have, right. and the discriminatory effect on the claimant. So, for this purpose, the aim of the framework is the research component. No, for this purpose, the aim of the framework are the four legitimate aims. Perhaps I can take you to what the tribunal found. Yes, please. <coughs> so, the tribunal's conclusions on justification under Section 151B are um, at paragraphs 265 to 71, which is at uh, pages 217 to 19. So what the...
tribunal does at the bottom of 265, it looks at, uh, sorry, at the bottom of 217. Paragraph 265, it relies upon four aims. You see the aims set out there. So adopting a, a consistent, transparent approach to progression, maintaining consistently high standards, maintaining reputation, and maintaining a balance of staff within individual schools and faculties commensurate with the requirements of its business. And the tribunal then goes um, in 266, it finds as to the first, uh, as to the three rejections, that's what the unfavorable treatment is here, we find that the university has shown that the aims were legitimate. And they say to ensure fairness and transparency as to B and C, these were to enable it to survive and prosper in the marketplace and to only engage staff where there was a business need, thereby balancing the provision of services against the proper utilization of public funds. So that is what the tribunal find are the legitimate aims of the university in uh, uh, in respect of the framework. Those were the legitimate aims of the framework. So just to be very clear, what is an issue on the framework is what I started out this morning in explaining, is that in the framework required either a PhD or to be on the pathway to a PhD and or excellence in research to, to short circuit that. On, in paragraph 267, it proceeds on the basis that justification will turn on whether the general rule or policy can be justified because the treatment of the claimant is a direct result of applying the general rule. That's the, the case of Buchanan, but I won't turn it up. At 268, uh, it concludes that the framework struck the right balance uh, and it says it was appropriate, reasonably necessary and no more than reasonably re necessary to achieve those aims. Uh, the university demonstrated the framework was adopted to provide, and then it sets out the aims, uh, and it, it ends with the sentence, but to ensure standards were maintained, while in turn linked into maintaining the university's reputation, and to place staff where there was a business need for them. <coughs> and then, uh, 269, it talks about the differing uh, skill sets and requirements, given those differing skill sets and requ requirements, that is a reference back to uh, what it talks about the, uh, in the paragraph before various faculties and the differing skill sets and requirements within them. In other words, a diversity of uh, faculties and um, subjects needed to be just that, a framework and process for decision making and what's more to be applied flexibly. Too much discretion could give rise to partiality and favoritism, too little an ability to address differing staffs. The, the differing needs of staff across various faculties and the wide range of disciplines taught within them. And at 270, it concludes that the framework was just that. It had various checks and balances within it. Uh, applicants only applied if they wanted to progress, <coughs> were only progressed if they demonstrated the required standards, and there was a business need. It talks about the different moderation at different levels uh, and uh, support for standards. Uh, and then it concludes at 271, we find the university has shown those aims were legitimate and the means of achieving them was reasonably necessary uh, and uh, that it was proportionate. And the explanation there, given the diversity of subjects and the consequential skill sets of the staff, in other words, consequential on the diversity of subjects, it's perhaps apt to adopt the imperfect metaphor that the, the university adopted the Goldilocks zone balance those competing obje objectives was just right, any unfavourable treatment there was justified. That's what it says about disability. And then can I just take you for completeness also at this point to what it says about um, age. That's at 296, paragraph 296 on page 225. And they say that those points, uh, various points that they've made above, which I'll, I'll come to, that's their conclusion, apply equally to the indirect age discrimination complaint and then it's repeated. Um, well, that's a bit abrupt. Where, where's their previous consideration of, of the age discrimination? 
and then well you see it uh, well let me let me just show you what they do so they they, re they refer there to page two paragraphs 280 and 83 and 282 to 283 is the justification section 19 disability so that's on page 221 And they refer back within that to the paragraphs I've just taken you to, 265 and 267. So they effectively say it's the same, it's the same, we look at the same conclusions. And then they deal with age over the page, and you see they set out their PCP, particular group disadvantage, etc. <coughs> and then the justification is just that paragraph that I took you to. So that's that's the scheme of how they deal with it. So, turning then to turning then to um, my submissions on, on, on these grounds, uh, we say uh, so. Uh, this is the submission about the discriminatory effect, and I, there are three separate points I wish to make as part of this uh, subground. One, the failure to consider the discriminatory effect on the individual as part of the balancing exercise, so I want to deal with that. Two, I want to deal with the analysis being infected by its earlier analysis uh, on causation. And three, uh, I will submit that a holistic reading of the judgment cannot rectify the errors in, this proportion in its proportionality assessment. Uh, and so dealing with point one, uh, at a very minimum, in order to conduct a proper proportionality assessment, the Employment Tribunal had to weigh the respondents' uh, needs and, and legitimate aims against the discriminatory effect of the unfavourable treatment and the PCP. Well, is, is that right in this case? Because if you look at paragraph 7, um, right near the beginning, there's a reference to Buchanan and the party's agreement that where A's treatment of B is the direct result of applying a general rule or policy to B, whether B's treatment is justified will usually depend on whether the general rule or policy is justified. So that was an agreed position about the law. My, my lady, and that's I, reflected I, I will, in the ET's analysis. Yes, I will, I will deal specifically with that point. Right. If you bear with me, I, I, I will deal with it. Uh, so we say what the authorities, and for time I'm simply not going to take you through them, but I, are they, they're there in my skeleton, and I've taken you to uh, a couple of the key points here. The tribunal has to weigh the needs and aims against the discriminatory effect, um, uh, uh, and we say that is the very crux of the balancing exercise inherent in the proportionality assessment. And you see that in the various references in Allenby, Hardy and Hanson, McCulloch, Homer, and Astor communities, and I, I won't take you them for time, but the weight of authority makes it clear it's not just the general impact, I will take you to Homer in a moment, it's not just the general impact of a PCP that needs to be considered, but the impact on the relevant individual, and you'll recall and I took you to Lord Justice Gage and Hardy and Hanson, he said an objective balance between the discriminatory effect of the condition on the employee and the reasonable needs of the employer. Uh, so too in uh, McCulloch and so too in Ryan, and I'll simply give the court the reference, paragraph 72 and 74b, which show the weight placed on the need to examine the discriminatory effect, both generally and upon the claimant, at the heart of the tribunal's analysis. Um, and of course, Astra itself. Uh, specifically, D 
deals with the significance of the impact on the affected individual. And we say that in our case, the impact is, of course, the disadvantage, the specific disadvantage in each year or the rejection in each year. But of course, it's much wider than just the disadvantage. Uh, one can't just look at the disadvantage and conclude that that's the only uh, impact. Uh, there would have been wider impacts. The wider impact in this case, of course, was not only did he get rejected in each year, but he would be rejected under with this framework, with this criteria, in every year because of his difficulty. Um, it, there, were wider, uh, uh, there were wider impacts, including uh, financial detriment uh, and non-pecuniary impact, the impact on his mental health. All of these were before the tribunal, the wider impact. In other words, you can't just look at the disadvantage and say that disadvantage has to be considered, but there's a wider perspective on proportionality when one looks at impact. But whether you look just at disadvantage or whether you look just at one issue or the wider issue, it's nowhere in the tribunal's analysis on justification, nowhere at all. Neither an, a consideration or analysis of the discriminatory effect of the framework on the claimant or indeed of older people in his age group for the age claim or people with a similar uh, with similar impact uh, who have ADHD or sleeping disorders. It's just simply not there in the analysis that we've looked at. Because the tribunal didn't consider and weigh the discriminatory effect of the framework against the respondent's aims, it couldn't carry out the critical evaluation which the case law imposes on it. At best, all it did in the 265 to 71 paragraphs that I took you to was focus on the diversity of subjects and faculties. In other words, it said, well, the, tr well, the framework has flexibility in it, and that flexibility reflects different faculties and different skill sets of staff in those faculties. But it, what it doesn't do is reflect on any flexibility or impact or effect on older applicants or on disabled applicants. What was the, what was the evidence on the, on the age complaint? Well, there was, um, there was considerable evidence um, before the tribunal as to uh, the impact on, in, uh, and they were set out in the claimant's pleaded case. Um, and I can give you the references if you like, but there, but, but what, what, but the, the, the critical point is you don't see any analysis at all of the discriminatory impact or effect, either on the claimant or on a wider disabled or older group. There's just not, it's just not there. What 265 to 271 does is look at the respondent's aims, and, and that's it. The only consideration of any impact relates to the difference in staff in different faculties. Doesn't look at the impact at all. But, but, but that's why I asked you the question about paragraph seven and yeah. seventy paragraphs. And, and that's why isn't that an explanation of the tribunal's approach? Because what the authorities establish is that whether it's section fifteen unfavourable treatment or whether it's uh, the PCP under section nineteen that requires justification, the discrimination this it, the discriminatory effect and impact on the individual have to be considered. But so how does that fit in with the principle that the ET derives from Buchanan, which is said to be common ground in paragraph 7? Well, if I take the, the court to Homer, perhaps I can best illustrate it with an example. Yeah. So Homer in the authorities bundle uh, is at tab 18, page 180, I think. Uh, and I'll invite the court to go to page 191, where uh, Baroness Hale, uh, she begins from the premise, paragraphs 20, 24, part of the assessment of whether the criterion can be justified, and tells a comparison of the impact of that criterion upon the effective group as against the importance of the aim to the employer. Uh, 
and then the last sentence of that page. So it has to be asked, or, or that, sorry, of that paragraph. So it has to be asked whether it was reasonably necessary in order to achieve the legitimate aim of the scheme to deny those benefits to people in this position. The ET didn't ask itself that question. And then, um, so in other words, the position of the group and the individual might coincide for Section 19 purposes, but the reality of the balancing exercise is likely to protest against the claimant themselves. And we see that because what, in the middle of that paragraph, what um, Baron's Health says, the comparison was lacking. Mr. Homer and anyone else in his position, had there been someone, was not being sacked or downgraded for not having a law degree. He was merely being denied the additional benefits associated with being at the highest grade. The most important benefit in practice is likely to have been uh, the impact upon his final salary and thus upon the retirement pension to which he became entitled. And then the question that I asked. So in other words, um, what the position of the group and the individual might coincide in a Section 19 case, but the rea reality of the balancing exercise is likely to be tested against the claimant themselves from an evidential point of view, either as a representative of the disadvantage or otherwise. Um, and, and similarly, in Ryan, at paragraph 74b, the impact on the claimant was central to that balancing exercise. Um, um, would it help if I, if I took the court to Ryan? Um, no, I, I was <coughs> noted that in the agreed appendix of law, the, um, it was agreed that the tribunal should refer to Astor and on proportionality that should refer to Astor at paragraph 28. And I just wanted to see what that was. I'm yes. sure you remember it. But yes, I I, I, it's, at, it's at tab uh, 24. It starts at the bottom of 3.11. The key paragraph is actually over the page. Yes. Um, and it sets out the threefold formulation that's well known. But then if I invite you to look just above C, yes. uh, this is the importance at the end of the exercise at, uh, of the overall balance between the ends and the means. There are some situations in which the ends, however meritorious, cannot justify the only means which is capable of achieving them. Uh, as the Court of Justice put it, the disadvantages caused yes. must not be disproportionate to the aims pursued. Uh, or, or as Lord Reed himself put it in Bank Mellet, in essence, the question at step four is whether the impact of the rights infringement is disproportionate to the likely benefit of the impugned yes. measure. Uh, and I think just while we have it in front of us then, could I just turn you to paragraph 31 of that judgment too, uh, which is on page 313. It's not sidelined, but it makes the point that the structured approach to proportionality asks whether there's any lesser measure which might achieve, in that case, the landlord's aims. It requires a balance to be struck between the seriousness <clears throat> of the impact on the tenant and the importance of the landlord's aims. So that, that, that's what Asta says, that you, you yeah. have to look at the, the individual impact. Yeah. Um, Thank you. And so that's what we say the authorities do. And, 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 and so we say that when I, when I gave you the example of section 19, uh, we say that even in the position of the group in Homer, the reality is that you have to conduct a balancing exercise, at least considering the impact on the group, if not in reality the individual, as was true in Homer. For section 15 purposes, one can see still less how the balancing exercise can be done without looking at the discriminatory impact on the individual, because of course there's no requirement of group disadvantage. So even if it's the general policy that has to be justified, and that was, uh, my lady, a common position below, that it was the general policy that had to be justified, that still had to be tested against the discriminatory effect on the individual. 
In our submission, the proportionality of the general policy which disadvantaged people with uh, ADHD in the claimant's position could only be properly tested by considering the impact on him himself. And we say that nowhere in the Employment Tribunal's analysis does it begin to test or weigh the discriminatory effect of the framework on the affected group, i.e. persons with ADHD or older persons, <laughs> against the respondent's aim, uh, still less the individual. So on any analysis, we say, uh, both for Section 15 and Section 19 purposes, the Tribunal has not weighed the discriminatory effect of the framework in the balancing exercise, and that is a core ingredient of any proper proportionality assessment. But doesn't it all go back to what the Tribunal understood the joint position on the law to be in paragraph 7? But the joint position on the law doesn't, re doesn't mean that... The joint position on, on what has to be justified doesn't mean that the discriminatory impact on the claimant should be ignored. Well, I'm not sure, because the ET may have thought that what the parties were agreeing was that all they had to do was to consider whether or not the general rule or policy was justified. But the question is, how is it justified, my lady? And in order to go through justification, one has to go through the step-by-step -step process that we just looked at, the four-stage test that is required. Well, I mean, yes, and yes, we're going round and round in circles. I'm, I, I'm simply trying to suggest that there may be an explanation for the approach which the ET adopted, which is what it understood the parties agreed well, position about the law to be. My lady, you may well be right, but if that's what is understood, it got the, the law wrong. All right. Um, and then I just want to deal um, quite quickly with my remaining points. Um, two, uh, this is subground two of the of the um, principal point on the infection analysis. Um, in short, if the tribunal went wrong in considering the legal questions for section 19 on PCP, group disadvantage, individual disadvantage, and for Section 15, whether the unfavourable treatment arose in consequence of disability, it can't be expected to weigh those matters, or it couldn't be expected to weigh those matters correctly in the balance. And one can't assume that it did do that. If it didn't recognise a discriminatory effect through causation, it couldn't weigh such effect in the balancing exercise that it was required to do. That's the most likely reason why it didn't do it. Um, but we say also that because it had misjudged the causative significance of the business case and the claimant's failure to engage, that flawed approach fed into its assessment of proportionality. Because we, of course, accept that the business case and or failure to engage may have been a relevant factor at section 15b uh, as, distinct, as distinct from section 151A and similarly for proportionality exercise for section 19. But its analysis at the proportionality stage of either the failure to engage or the business case would have been, should have been, qualitatively different when weighed as part of a balancing exercise and its impact on the claimant. In order to do that, it would have needed to address specifically how the business case aspect of the framework was made, assessed, or determined. Another example of the infection of the business case relates to how it was deployed in the two strands of the justification test. It found that one of the respondents' legit legitimate aims was to ensure staff were only promoted, this is paragraph 268, where there was a business need, thereby balancing the provision of services against proper utilisation of public funds. It was against that legitimate aim of ensuring promotions uh, only took place where there was a business case and other aims that the tribunal tested the proportionality of the framework. But its argument was circular. <coughs> In concluding that the framework was appropriate to and reasonably necessary to achieving the respondent's aims, it reasoned at paragraph 270, applicants only applied if they wanted to progress and were only progressed if they demonstrated they met the required standards and need. So on their own analysis, the business case appears to be both the end and the means. And for the reason we've already stated, that we don't know exactly what the business case was, whether it was the same as a business need and whether it was the same as a budget because they were used interchangeably. That has significant implications for the assessment of it and its use in, in the proportionality and the justification exercise. The point is, 
the tribunal misjudged the causative significance of the business case to the effect it couldn't see the disadvantage to the appellant caused by the framework. If that was the case, there was no hope of conducting a proper proportionality exercise. And then the third subpart to this uh, ground is that a holistic reading can, of the judgment cannot cure the defect on uh, critical examination relating to the balancing exercise required. Um, and we say that without evidence that the tribunal undertook that critical evaluation required in respect of proportionality, it hadn't conducted the balancing e evaluation it was required to perform. First, the judgment, as we've already said, was littered with different areas of law and fact. But beyond that, its findings in one part of the judgment cannot safely be transposed into the proportionality balancing exercise required of it later on. Uh, and I'll take two specific points to make that good. Uh, turning to the Employment Tribunal's assessment of substantial and particular disadvantage under Section 19 and Section 151A, because the focus of the analysis for substantial and particular disadvantage is different, it cannot be assumed that any analysis under those headings discharges the Tribunal's duty to undertake a critical evaluation of discriminatory effect and proportionality, because they're not the same. Under substantial or particular disadvantage, what one is looking at is the comparative disadvantage an individual faces in, for example, satisfying a criterion. In, that, in, in this case, that was increased difficulty or reduced opportunity from satisfying the requirements of the framework and achieving promotion. Homer illustrates that point. Um, uh, I, I've, taken, I, I've, I've taken you to, that, to, the, to those points, but we see that the relevant particular disadvantage in Homer for Section 19 purposes was the increased difficulty or reduced opportunity for older persons to obtain law degrees and consequently to achieve promotion to a higher grade. But the discriminatory effect, which uh, Lady Hale um, uh, said was critical and relevant to the assessment of proportionality, included the impact on the claimant salary and pension benefits of not achieving promotion before retirement. So on the facts of this case, our case, the substantial disadvantage was the re reduced likelihood or opportunity to meet the criteria. The discriminatory effect on him was wider, and it ranged through a, a, a series of matters relating to promotion, financial opportunity, non-pecuniary impact. Moving then to the tribunal's analysis on reasonable adjustments, and I know that my, my learned friend uh, says that this is a critical part of, of, of it's a critical part of his skeleton. Uh, and we simply say this: the fact that there is no Section 20 duty uh, on the employer to make reasonable adjustments, whether that's because that claim has failed or otherwise, is not in and of itself an answer to the justification question in Section 15 or Section 19. So the tribunal's assessment of reasonableness under Section 20 and 21 cannot be transported wholesale and cannot subsequently rectify the flaws in its proportionality assessment. Um, and with the court's permission, and I will finish by quarter to three, uh, I'd like to just um, I'd like to uh, just take the court to um, the EAT's judgment in Boyers, which I is really don't know, to Ms. Jolly. You said you'll finish by quarter to three. I will. I really don't think we shall be embarking on more authority. Why, why don't you just give us the reference? Yes, I will. I will give you the headline point. So Boyers, which is tab uh, thirty-seven, page five six one. Um, this was a, a, a Section 15 dismissal, and I invite the court to look at 22, 23, uh, 26, and 30. And, and the point is, effectively, although, um, although the case of Griffiths illustrates, what that case is, the case of Griffiths illustrates that if an employer has lost on Section 20, in other words, the employer is obliged to make reasonable adjustments, then that is very likely to be extremely relevant for Section 15 justification, because if the employer could have made a reasonable adjustment and didn't, it's going to be very difficult for the employer to justify the unfavourable treatment. 
But the converse isn't true. That's the critical point. The converse isn't true, and Boyers makes that point and explains why. And, and so too, I also just point you to Scott and Kenton in the authorities, I think it's tab 32 and paragraph 60 to 64. And the reason for that is because claims under section 15, 19 and 20 have distinctive characteristics. There might be potential for overlap, but the tests are completely different and they employ different statutory language. For example, the knowledge requirements for section 20, knowledge of substantial disadvantage, are not replicated in any of the other provisions. Section 15 only requires knowledge of disability. Section 19 doesn't require at all. So one could fail, as happened in this case, on reasonable adjustments, because the medical evidence on a particular time when the adjustment was sought wasn't viewed to be sufficient for reasonable purposes. But that assessment might look quite different from an analysis of proportionality. In short, reasonable adjustments cannot be conflated with the balancing exercise required, section 15 and 19. Tribunals have to apply the statutory provisions separately. Uh, and then, so that deals with that ground. Um, I, I want to then deal very quickly with um, the failure to consider a series of other relevant factors to the proportionality exercise. And to that end, I simply uh, invite the uh, court to, to look at our skeleton, but in particular, I just want to take you to paragraph 81 of our skeleton. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, and that deals with the series of other relevant factors that we say the tribunal should have considered uh, and were before the, the tribunal. So the availability of less discriminatory measures, alternative measures, the extent to which promoting the claimant would have compromised the achievement of its aims in view as professional experience, ability, high levels of student satisfaction, etc., all there. The modest cost of promotion, given he was already undertaking grade 7 work, and the fact that teaching focused roles already existed, which only required 20% of the role to be dedicated to research. We say that those were all put forward by the claimant at first instance. They were all relevant to the question of proportionality. Uh, and I would simply invite the court also to look at the case of Ryan, and that point's made good in paragraph 74, 72 to 74. Uh, and finally, I won't say any more about the third of those subgrounds, the elision of the legitimacy of aims with the question of proportionality. I, I think I've sufficiently taken the court through that one too. So in conclusion on proportionality for ground two and four, we say... The tribunal had to ask itself the right questions at the correct stage. It was required to do so in law, and it didn't. It had to consider and weigh the discriminatory effect of the framework within the balancing exercise. It's clear that it didn't. It had to have regard to material factors which could have a bearing on proportionality uh, in many cases, or it, it did not. Um, and uh, to, to, to conclude, as Lord Justice uh, uh, Elias observed in McCulloch, or, uh, as he then was, uh, it's not enough that the tribunal might have had in mind the correct approach. It has to be demonstrated in the tribunal's reasoning. And we say it plainly was not. And you say on remedy, you say that um, under grounds one and three, the tribunal has uh, reached findings of fact which are so clearly perverse or badly analysed results should be an outright win in this court. Yes. We give judgment for the claimant, as yes. it were. Um, on grounds two and four, uh, you don't go that far, but you say that the uh, legal analysis is so bad that the case would have to be, uh, assuming you hadn't won on one and three, the case would have to start again before a freshly constituted yes. tribunal. Yes. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Thank Jackson. You. You're not going to add anything. No, the Lady Chief Justice is in and Master of the Rolls are encouraging us to call on juniors. But since there's <coughs> only a minute and a half left, um, uh, a bow will be sufficient. Yes, Mr. Williams. My Lady, my Lords, if I may make four points of general application before dealing with each of the four grounds of appeal. The first point is the obvious point any respondent to an employee
appointment tribunal appeal is going to make, and it relates to how this court should approach its analysis of the tribunal's judgment generally and this appointment tribunal judgment in particular. Uh, I know the court will be uh, aware of this, but it's worth repeating that uh, I've said on a number of occasions that a tribunal's judgment shouldn't be read like a statute or a deed. And as Lord Justice Hardy, uh, uh, sorry, Lord Justice Thomas, in the case of Hardy says, and the, the, I'm not going to take you to these extracts because of the passage of time, uh, my lord, but it's uh, Authority Bundle 1, tab 15, page 142. Did the tribunal carry out the minimum analysis expected of it? And there's another reference from Lord Justice Sedley, which I, I may give you. That again is the case of Allenby, uh, Authorities Bundle 1, tab 12. Page 63. And it's this that it's not appropriate to expect <coughs> uh, every analysis of every fact and argument with reasons for accepting or rejecting them. What matters is whether the decision under appeal was a permissible option. The next point I want to make in regard to uh, tribunal judgments is, it, again, the obvious one that has the fact finders. Fact-finding forum, they're of course best placed to assess and weigh uh, the evidence to make its findings a fact. Taking uh, the court, if I may, to these particular, both the EAT's judgment and the employment tribunal judgment, the length of them, uh, the respondent would say, is, is testimony not only to the time in which they took to analyse Mr. Pipe's case, but the care in which they took. Uh, and it can be contrasted uh, with, for example, the case of Allenby, which was only uh, 12 pages of written reasons. And finally, uh, my Lord, uh, as uh, Mrs Justice Eady said in the EAT judgment, uh, one must read any tribunal judgment holistically. The second general point I want to make, my Lord, is of particular importance to universities, such as the respondent, and it goes to what one would call the competence standard of employees and academics, and I hope it's a point that isn't uh, in dispute, that a university is entitled to expect its senior academics have certain qualifications and skills, and that clearly provides the context by which, in this case, the frame framework was introduced to drive up academic standards and the respondent's reputation as a, a provider of higher education. But in the disability context, which resonates in this case, a university cannot be expected to promote disabled employees who, with, even with reasonable adjustments, still can't meet those qualifications and skills. Now, the respondent says that point has even more force when those disabled employees refuse to engage with that university's attempts to help them during a promotion process. My Lord, uh, Miss Jolly, my learned friend, has done it for you, but the third point relates to carefully identifying what the disadvantage is uh, that Mr Pipe says he was subjected to. And that's effectively because of uh, impairments to his executive functioning, it was substantially more difficult for him to satisfy uh, the university's framework requirements, in particular the PhD slash research requirements. Now, the reason I focus on the disadvantage at this stage in general terms, my Lord, is there are these three causes of action that were before the tribunal. There was uh, the failure to make reasonable adjustments, Section 20, uh, disability arising discrimination, and then for both age and uh, disability and direct discrimination. But they're mm -hmm. effectively diff saying the same thing. And uh, in contrast to what my learned friend was saying, the findings in one can plainly be relevant to findings in the other two causes of action. And why I say they're effectively saying the same thing is that they have behind them the assertion that by rejecting the claimant's promotion application, the respondent failed to alleviate uh, the disadvantage of his disability and or age, and that, that that failure was discriminatory. The fourth and final point of general uh, 
application I want to make is relating to the tribunal's findings of fact. Now, the respondent's position is the claimant's appeal and well-argued written submissions and indeed oral submissions by my learned friend is not actually in fact grounded in the multiple findings of fact that you find in the 295 paragraph judgment about what the framework was, how it was applied in practice, how it was applied to the claimant's promotion applications, and what was the reason or the cause for his failure to be promoted in each of these three years. And I would uh, ask this court to uh, view, view this appeal through this key prism, which is that the respondents were doing their best, and the tribunal made multiple findings about this, to help Mr. Pike with his promotion applications. And that included finding alternative ways of meeting the framework requirements uh, for that PhD requirement and the research requirement. That's, that's, that's a point uh, which I say underpins uh, any attack on this judgment. And the second one is that the claimant failed to engage in those efforts. And there are countless references. I've given a number in, my, uh, in our skeleton argument. But there's a key finding of fact, and that's at uh, paragraph 239. Uh, I'm just going to read it out to you, my lord, if I may, and that's at uh, four bundle 212. And it's this finding, that responsibility for the absence of a pathway to a traditional PhD lay at the claimant's door. So if an alternative pathway had been found, the disadvantage he, he is complaining about, and of course there's a respondent relying on the business case and we rely on the findings of fact, but what he is saying the disadvantage he was uh, subjected to would have been ameliorated and he would have had no claim uh, for discrimination. So on the face of it, those findings that I've just referenced hardly provide a fertile ground with which to launch a challenge for the tribunal's findings that the university's framework uh, did not discriminate against him. Now, my lord, I make... Uh, a number, well, I reference a number of other findings of fact that we say are key in, my, uh, in our skeleton at paragraph 11. That's at uh, 4 by 392. And with, without repeating them, they effectively go to the inherent flexibility that the framework uh, provides. Yes, you don't, you don't need to yes. read it out. Um, the, the, the last one with, to which you just Referred, referred us um, two three nine. Responsibility for the absence of a pathway to a traditional PhD lay at Mr. Pipe's door. Is the word alternative missed out? It, 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 it seems a rather odd sentence. It is, my lord, but plainly it must be because. Uh, <laughs> Something that is not the traditional PhD has to be an alternative to that PhD. Yeah. And if you read the preceding paragraphs, my lord, I think it is plain that's what the tribunal uh, are referencing. I think there is numerous references in that judgment to alternative. Yes. It just doesn't appear at that that's paragraph. 237. Yeah. Right. Sorry. Two, uh, two, of course. Three. So just to make those points on flexibility, my lord, and uh, that's even before one gets to the primary argument that the respondent made and falls behind uh, in terms of the tribunal's finding and the EAT's analysis of it about there was no business case uh, for a particular role. And I'll come back to the importance of the words particular uh, role in due course. So if I may deal with the first ground, which is the causation point. I mean, it's a straightforward headline that uh, it's an effective perversity challenge uh, dressed up as a challenge on law because it's plain the Employment Tribunal had the key legal principles in mind, because they're annexed to its judgment uh, in the agreed statement of law. I think that's Appendix B. And they made a finding of fact about the effective cause of the non-promotions, and that finding of fact weighing up the evidence was a permissible one. Now, the respondents uh, don't dispute, and I think the Tribunal were aware there can be more reason, or more than one reason uh, for particular treatment. Uh, the central test is whether it is the effective uh, reason. Now, if I can take you to uh, Mrs. Justice Similar as she was in the case of 
Paisner, I think that's right, Paisner, uh, which you were taken to by uh, Miss Jolly. That's at tab 26, which is bundle 2, authorities bundle. And it is at uh, paragraph 31. You were taken to that uh, paragraph. And it's 31B I want to take you to. The very first sentence, which is dealing with section 15.1a analysis, the tribunal must determine what caused the impugned treatment or what was the reason for it. Sorry, my lord, I'll let you find find that paragraph. So it's page 8, so it's authority bundle 336, and it's paragraph 31B of Mrs. Justice Simler's judgment. So what's required of the tribunal is, is, is effectively saying that well, you look, you, they should be looking at what causes it or what the reason for it is. And in terms of what causes the non-promotion, well, that's plainly clear on what the tribunal find and is grounded in evidence they had uh, before them. Sorry, Lord, I was just waiting for I saw you were reading. No, no, I, 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 we looked at it before. D seemed to me um, rather significant. A question of fact, robustly, uh, in each case. Yes. Well, we say for each of the years there are those uh, findings of fact. Uh, Lady Justice Lang has already uh, referenced uh, the, the Hawkins, uh, Mr. Hawkins' paragraphs, uh, 46 to, to 49, which the tribunal find very influential in their fact-finding, that effectively the claimant was told in advance of applying for his 2017 application that there wasn't a business case to support his application. Twenty eighteen, uh, you've got the fact that the application is supported by Mr Dawkins this time and the head of school, though if you look carefully at the second paragraph of the head of schools, you've looked at it already, uh, when she's referencing the business case, there are some doubts about the increase in salary scale and the need for additional hours. That's what it physically said in terms of the evidence that was before the tribunal. Uh, you've got the consideration by this by Dr Hyde and the budget availability is crossed out. So again, there is evidence that plainly would support uh, a, a permissible finding about the budget case in 2018. And then you get to 2019, which uh, surely refers it to our, uh, the, the high case of or the respondent's submissions on business case. Now, I want to take you to paragraph 135, if I may. My Lord, that's the core bundle 190. Sorry, it's 133. Apologies, uh, my Lord. It's uh, the page before 189. The tribunal make reference to an email exchange between Mr. Pipe and Dr. Clark on the 7th of March 2019, which is before he makes his 2019 application. And it, it categorizes that email as saying, in which Mr. Pipe explained he'd secured an extension of the period to apply for progression, but acknowledged it was unlikely a business case could be made because of falling numbers. But I've made the point in, my, in our skeleton argument, my lord, that actually that's uh, perhaps miscategorizing it for the benefit of Mr. Pipe. Because if you actually look at the email itself, and that is uh, in the supplemental bundle, so that's the little bundle at uh, SB75.
and it's by the second hole puncher. So you see the email dated at 1257 from Mr. Clark to Mr. Dr. Clark. Hi, Jim, I'm putting in another progression application. Deadline put back to March 25th for me. It will fail no matter how good if a business case can't be made. We have falling numbers. I want to make two points about that. One is that clearly uh, is uh, critical evidence to support the findings of fact on 2019, but it also supports the respondent's position that the business pay case was critical for 2017-2018. That links back to the previous findings and what uh, the claimant would have been told, because how else would he have worked that out if he'd not been told it or surmised it himself? Now, that is then captured, or the consequences of the falling numbers and the consequences for business cases. Uh, uh, Dr. Garrett Brown's, as head of school, uh, analysis of the uh, business case to put, or not in this case, put Mr. Pipe forward. That's at SB 86. And it's by the second hole punch, and it starts with a, a, from a business case perspective. I, I believe you may have already been uh, taken to that, but not in, not by yes. reading it in light of what uh, Mr. Piper just said about falling numbers. But you'll see, uh, from a business case perspective, unfortunately not able to support the growth or extension of level in the staff base with journalism due to falling numbers. Uh, and my lord, you've already uh, noted that's quite a significant fall from 196 uh, to 119. So there is plainly uh, we say credible evidence for a, a tribunal to make the finding of fact it, it made. If I can take you to how Mrs. Justice Eady deals with this point, that's at the core bundle, page 95, and it's at paragraph 160 of her judgment. well, if not better, how I could uh, uh, phrase it. It's by the second hole punch of that page. And it starts, even if the claimant... Do you have that, my lord? Um, which paragraph? Paragraph 160, by the second hole punch. Oh, I see, yes. yes. Even if the claimant had been able. Yes. Even if the claimant had been able to demonstrate he met the requisite standards for progression, he still would have been treated unfavourably because there was no business case for him to take up the grade seven role. And that was uh, the point I, I thought Justice Morley was making to my uh, learned friend. That that I'm so sorry, it's my fault. <laughs> Which paragraph? Oh, apologies. Uh, no, no, it's my fault. It's, uh, it's paragraph 160. I keep talking about the second hole punch, so I should start with a paragraph 160. And it's by the second hole punch. And it says, even if the claim could be demonstrated, and it goes on for three sentences and stops it uh, to take up a grade seven role. Sorry, this is in the EAT judgment. This, sorry, this is the EAT judgment. I was just saying it, it, it's phrased perhaps better than or, yeah. as, I, as I would phrase uh, the analysis. Okay. So even if he met the standards, he still would have been treated unfavourably. And that's the finding at uh, ET paragraph 259, core bundle 217. Even if Mr. Pipe had met the progression criteria, his applications would ne have necessarily failed because there were no role for him. And it's an obvious point, but a point worth making. You're not going to get promoted if there's no role to be promoted into. <coughs> now, I'll briefly deal with uh, my learned friend's point on paragraph 261 of the ET's judgment. And if you uh, labelled it as a strange feature of it, it was referencing another reason. Mm -hmm. So that's at page, uh, it's core bundle 217. It, it, it starts with in any event. You see that, my lord? Uh, so yes. this is more like a, an analysis. Well, in, by the by, in any event, he would he, he had difficulties, would have had difficulties meeting the requirements because he didn't engage 
the alternative pathways. My Lord wanted a reference to alternative. alternative. There you have one. Uh, one, two, three, four down. You know, from the possibility of alternative pathways. Didn't engage. Well, uh, that's a reference to in any event. It's not saying that's the... Some doesn't negate the primacy of the business case, I would say, that paragraph, particularly when you've got... I think I counted... Uh, 19 paragraphs in that judgment that reference that the business case or the business need. Hmm. So, sorry, you're saying that paragraph 261 is just um, superfluous to the core reasoning of UT? Yes, because it says in any event. Right. And it, it would have to be because of the primacy of the business case they, they found in all the preceding paragraphs. It's just making the point. Had he, had he actually engaged, uh, there might have been alternative pathways for him, but Plainly, there's no business case. That's still going to fail. Uh, and it's a. Uh, but God, sorry, my lady. Sorry to yes. you again. Not at all. Uh, if you go on to the following paragraph, what what do you say, if anything, about the slightly odd formulation, not satisfied objective applications caused by the something? Instead, they stand for the absence of the business case for a role, and or. His failure to engage. It, it is a, it is an odd feature, my lady. Uh, plainly on, on all the other all the other because, because twenty nine paragraphs. The, the case against you is well, that just contradicts the finding in um two sixty. It's inconsistent with it. Well, it is inconsistent, and that's in in so far as it is there. But you have to read, I say, the judgment holistically, and that's why I would say, in any event, that would go to the point. Had he had he cooperated, there might have been alternative pathways. But the log the over I'd say the overwhelming logic of this judgment, yeah. and what the university was saying, is if there's no business case. So you would, so you would accept that 262 is the last bit of 262 is hard to to reconcile with 260, but you say 261 and 262 are superfluous. Yes. Okay. I, I do, my lady. And it, it goes to the point uh, you were making to Miss Jolly that uh, a reason can be given to a, an applicant in terms of feedback, but it doesn't have to have been the reason for the treatment. And uh, we say that's very much what was captured here. It's uh, If you want the reference to how uh, all the bits, the EAT judgment, paragraph 162, core bundle 96, that Mr Justice Eby makes reference to this. An employer can give feedback, doesn't necessarily mean it was the uh, the, the effective cause for uh, the decision. Yes, part, part of the evidential picture, and it's for the ET to... Weigh it up. Yeah. And there's nothing perverse, we say, in this exercise, particularly as I've taken you through what they had before them. Another ET may have come to another decision, but this ET came to that permissible decision, uh, weighing up the evidence they had to them. And it, perhaps if I can deal... Perhaps I should have started dealing with the, the essence of what a, a business case is, or the challenge to it, from, from my learned friend. And it's really what, what in reality that is. The, I, I make the reference to paragraph 75 of my skeleton, that, and that's a, a core bundle 407, but I don't need to take you to it. This sort of the common sense element of that is if, if there isn't a role or money to support that role, then you can have the best qualified candidate in the world, but they're not going to get promoted. It's, it, it is the reason why someone would not get promoted in the we would say the nature of a business case. And so my learned friend says, well, there was budget available. Well, it's more than just having budget available. Uh, it is whether there was a business, this is what the findings of fact, I say the tribunal says, it is whether there's a business need to use the available money for a particular role at a particular time. Now, my learned friend references the promotion uh, of his comparator. Comparator is the wrong word, not to talk about direct discrimination. His, his job share. Uh, and my learned friend made, laid great weight on, uh, well, there was budget for that individual, uh, but not, not for the claimant. Well, two, two, two problems with that, I would say, my lord. But the first one, uh, as Justice Lang pointed out to my learned friend, was. Uh, it was an external application. But the second one is it doesn't work on the timing. Uh, if you look at 
paragraph 122. And you'll recall, oh, sorry, 122 of the tribunal's judgment, which is at Court uh, Bundle 186 to 187. At the bottom of page C 186, you'll, you'll, talk, you'll see the date where Mr. Pipe was uh, called at home by Mr. Falk. The court will be aware these promotion applications happen in the spring, they happen in March, so this is an event that's happening subsequently in September, which is why I said a particular role available at a particular time. Uh, he's called by Mr. Falk as a matter of courtesy to inform that his job chair, Lisa Perry, be made a lecturer. I don't think it was in dispute, my lord, that she was made a lecturer months after his application. And it, as I understand it, was because uh, a role was vacated and she was able to then fill that role. But that is months later, and it was an external process. So my learned friend's point on, ah, oh, there was budget for this role, doesn't actually chime uh, with what reality was and what that paragraph is effectively saying. My Lord, is there anything else you'd like me to say on ground one? Other than just to repeat my point, this is effectively a perversity challenge that doesn't meet that high threshold. Mm. Uh, grateful. Well, well, if I take you to uh, ground three and, and disadvantage. Yes. Well, the headline is there's plainly no disadvantage to the claimant under uh, section 19.2c, which is a particular feature of uh, the indirect discrimination test. Oh, forgive me. Oh. I, I should have passed on it. Um, one. I, it may be me, but I, I can't find the separate age claim or the treatment of the age claim beyond the tribunal saying towards the end of the judgment for, for the same reasons we reject it. But it, it, um, where, where was the allegation that that's um, for justification. I need to talk about paragraph. So let's just go to it, my lord. So yeah. that's called bundle two two five, isn't it? That short paragraph. I think you referenced. Yes, um, yeah. but before you have to decide what what the disadvantage or unfavourable treatment is, and it may be thought obvious that um, applicants for promotion with ADHD and sleep disorder. Um, start from a disadvantaged position, but it's not as obvious that uh, applicants for promotion aged over 55 um, uh, start from a disadvantaged pos position. Where, where, where are the findings about that? Uh, well, my Lord, I understand it was put forward on the, the There's This Authority Games, which is it, sorry, my rope's just been caught in the back of the. <laughs> Quite badly, <laughs> actually. We I have to ignore that. Um, <laughs> it rips. So. Yes. <laughs> Forgive me. Yes. Um, it's actually really badly caught. Is that? It's, you might sh why, why, why don't you sit down and, and <laughs> yes, stand up again? Yes, yeah. 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 We don't want that to be a. Uh, <laughs> happened before? <laughs> there we go. Sorry, my lord, do you ask yes. me where? Uh, yes. Um, where, where, the, where is the. Um, any findings about whether this is the case? I, I don't know. It might be said that it, it, for, for some jobs, based on experience, the, um, uh, the starting point for discrimination cases may be the other way around. But, um, but I don't know. Where, where, where are the findings about age? Well, it, it's a 286, so the preceding couple of pages, yes. my lord, uh, which talks about the particular disadvantage, uh, I suppose ultimately it's because they have less time to acquire, or A, they, they, they have less time to acquire, that's right, isn't it? Less time to acquire the PhD, and that was the point in games, this, this authority, which I can take you to in due course when I get to it. Go on. But in that, in games, there was this, it wasn't a flexible requirement, you had to have a PhD requirement, I think Mr. Games was late 50s. Uh, and that was how that case was met, that, that case was put forward. Uh, and I, I was going to deal with age 
my lord a bit further on. All right, yeah, that's I, fine. I, I understand why you asked ca it. Ca ca carry on with ground three. No, I'm very grateful. So the, the headline, my lord, is there's no uh, particular disadvantage to the claimant under section 192C because of uh, the findings around the business case. He wouldn't have been treated as the... Uh, Group would have been treated for indirect discrimination, and that explains the uh, uh, treatment for the disability arising. But y you're right, uh, my lord, to reference what we said in the, uh, our skeleton. I think you said you, you, you scanned it, looked at it. I can take you to it how, how we put this point. That's at call bundle 408. And 80, paragraph 82 at the bottom of that page is referencing the ESOP point about the, uh, the undeserving applicant, in effect. But I won't take that just, just there. It's more uh, the claimant wasn't subjected to that disadvantage and the reason for his failures was because of a lack of business case. That's, that's, my, that's the primary point. But I do make other points, if, ne if I need them, that the fr for disadvantage, the framework that was, was applied and would have been applied flex flex flexibly to him was not the abstract categorization of, of the PCP. Further, it was his failure to engage that led to a failure to find an alternative pathway to promotion. So it, I, I make that point, my lord, only to only say, yes, it's the primary point on business case to make good on disadvantage, but there are some other points I can rely on if need be grounded in the findings of fact. Now, there's no perversity challenge, as I understand it, to the tribunal's findings on disadvantage. It's mean, mainly uh, how they applied the law to it. Now, it goes back to what I said, the general point of how the interlinking between those three causes of actions and how findings in one can resonate and support uh, at findings and analysis in another. And you may not have picked up, or you may have picked up, uh, uh, that ground three was a previous ground in front of EAT. That was old ground eight on disability and old ground nine for age. But there was another interlinked point, an appeal point before the EAT, which is not before you now, and that was ground two, and that was the finding that there was, in fact, no substantial disadvantage to the claimant in respect to reasonable adjustments. Now, the respondent is not saying that's the knockout point, uh, the fact he failed on reasonable adjustments, and the fact there was no substantial disadvantage, in fact, uh, but it's plainly uh, an important part of any factual analysis for a tribunal to carry out, and I'll make good the point as I I take this point forward. Because if you look at that para 279, my lord, that's at core bundle 221. And this, this appeal is solely in relation to uh, this appeal point is the indirect discrimination disadvantage point. Yes. Uh, so this is how the tribunal deal with it at para 279. They, they acknowledge the different statutory tests. So it's plain they're not conflating the two or eliding the two. They're talking here between uh, reasonable adjustment, substantial disadvantage, uh, and disadvantage indirect discrimination. Do you have it, my lord? It's, it's by yes. the first hole punch. Indeed. Uh, the points we make is the disadvantage appear, apply here, not just to Mr. Pipe, but to members of the group. I'll come back to that in a minute, but group disadvantage. We adopt the points we make regards to disadvantage in relation to the adjustments complaint at 219.225. Now, the respondent said that's permissible uh, to have taken into account findings on substantial disadvantage when uh, considering questions of, of disadvantage. Now, stopping there, yeah, I've effectively said that point. Having done an analysis on reasonable adjustments, it's permissible to consider. Uh, disadvantage to a claimant as an individual for an indirect discrimination. Now, in practical terms, the distinction between substantial disadvantage and particular disadvantage, so substantial disadvantage under Section 20 means more than minor or trivial, mm -hmm. and particular disadvantage uh, is, uh, does not connote a disadvantage that was serious, obvious, and particularly significant. I say, really, that's a distinction without, a, without much difference. Uh, you're talking about something that's more than trivial in both cases. There's a very low threshold in, ba in both. And, and I have Lord Justice Elias to support me in that in the case of Griffiths. That's Authorities Bundle 2, 
tab 27, page 359. That's at paragraph 62. So just to be clear, just what the facts of Griffiths are about, uh, my lord, it was a, uh, a disability arising complaint because an employer took account 62 days of uh, what we'd call related to disability sickness uh, in, a, in a period of sickness absence and dismissing uh, the individual as a result of that. But if you look at paragraph 62, it, it says, it starts with in that case, Lord Justice Elias, do you have that point, my lord, in that case? question of disadvantage was being considered in the context of indirect discrimination and it's referencing a, a ECJ case at paragraph 61 and it's uh, it's one two three lines down between E and F here we are concerned with the concept of disadvantage in section 20 so a reasonable adjustments complaint but there is no basis for giving it a different meaning so it is plainly permissible uh, if Lord Justice Elias is correct for a tribunal to view the disadvantage under section 20, the reasonable adjustments complaint, as the, the same, or giving it as the same meaning for an indirect discrimination complaint. But, but in any event, my lord, the, the disadvantage is in, factually, in this case, the same. It's uh, the difficulties in meeting the framework requirements in relation to the PhD and or research requirements. Now, there's no suggestion uh, that the ET should have been required to reach a different conclusion, we say, uh, my lord, for indirect discrimination disadvantage. And that's uh, what Mrs. Justice Eady says at paragraph 135 of bundle 86. And within that, those paragraphs uh, of the ET's judgment is uh, the analysis of why the tribunal were correct to do that. And that's Start at paragraph 129, that's at core bundle 84. And this goes to the business case point, the, the knockout element of the business case point. You see, uh, more generally, the ET found that regardless of any disadvantage the claimant might have suffered in respect of the PhD pathway to progression, the lack of a business case to support each of his applications meant the result would have been the same if he'd suffered no impairment. And there was no relevant disadvantage as a result of the application of the framework in any of the instances relied on uh, by the claimant. And she's dealing, my lord, if you go back to uh, a couple of pages, uh, it's power 122, you'll see the heading is disadvantage. And there uh, she's dealing with the three challenges there were failure to make uh, reasonable adjustments about disadvantage, not being a substantial disadvantage, indirect disability discrimination and indirect age discrimination. So in some sense, my Lord, the, the, the submissions echo what we're saying on causation, but uh, the lack of the business case in each of those three years meant the result would have been the same if he'd suffered no impairment, so there can't be any actual disadvantage to Mr. Pipe under 192C. So that not an error to have viewed these two concepts or relied on the section 20 analysis in section 19 because the result is the same uh, for both of them. Then there's the alternative uh, points about, my lord, the flexibility of the framework. And how you've got to look at what, in fact, the frame, how the framework was applied in practice to others and how it was applied uh, to Mr. Pipe. And the finding that uh, Mr. Justice Eady uh, concurs with this is that it would have been applied to him flexibly, the PhD research requirement. He didn't actually uh, eventually need a PhD and or the research requirement. So he wasn't subjected to the group disadvantage he says he was on the findings of fact of the tribunal.
So, for, Lord, for those reasons, uh, the tribunal's analysis was both permissible in law and uh, permissible on the findings of fact. And if I'm correct on grounds one and three, then one doesn't get to uh, justification. But obviously, I need to deal with justification. Oh, sorry, my Lord, I'm rushing ahead. Are there any other points you'd like me to make or wish to hear from you on the question of disadvantage? No. Right. Rush ahead. Okay. <laughs> Again, the, the grounds two and four, you see the headline point, uh, Ms. Jolly tra 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 trailed it for me, but the tribunal carried out the minimum structured analysis expected of it. Now again, uh, well, I was going to make this point a bit further down, but uh, insofar as there's this criticism by, of the tribunal for failing to take into account the individual circumstances of uh, Mr. Pike, that's a difficult one, I'd say, to make, given the, uh, Lady Justice Lang has, has already noted, that it was common ground that you wouldn't take that into account when considering justification. You would look at the PCP as it was. But I take you again to what Lord Justice, uh, relying on what Lord Justice Elias has said. So I relied on what he said in Griffiths about there being no difference between disadvantage for Section 19 and Section 20. He makes the same point. I don't know if you've still got it open. Now, this is a bit further. This is a, few, a paragraph 27, so it's a couple of pages before. So it's 300 and, uh, 350. Authorities Bundle 350, halfway down paragraph 27. And, and I say the point to take from, from this paragraph is that when you're considering the proportionality analysis for both disability arising uh, and indirect discrimination, uh, Lord Justice Elias was saying, if you've got, it says both require essentially the same proportionality exercise. I, uh, I hope the course is there's one, two, three, four. Five lines down on paragraph 27. And it goes on, strictly in the case of indirect discrimination, it is the PCP which needs to be justified, whereas in the case of discrimination arising out of disability, it's the treatment. But in practice, the treatment will flow from the, sorry, the treatment will flow from the application of the PCP. So we say a very clear statement of law uh, that the exercise you carry out for, for both is essentially the same. So what do you say about the last sentence which Ms. Jolly emphasised? Well, it's, it, it is, yes, of course, there's always that possibility. Try I said they're interlinked at the start, these, these three causes of action. Uh, and that is, that is a true statement, but I think as a, as, a, as a legal principle, I can rely on what Lord Justice Elias says well, certainly the tribunal don't fall into error, legal error, by conducting the same uh, proportionality exercise for both indirect discrimination, that would include, include disability in age and uh, disability arising. And I hadn't understood that it was a challenge uh, by uh, Mr. Pipe's appeal that the, uh, there was an error, it was an error to apply the same test for justification. Because the, the reason why it's important, uh, my lord, and perhaps I'll just take you to the language of indirect discrimination and what it is you are justifying, and that's in the first tab, and it's behind uh, divider, well, page 14, which is straightforward. This is under Indirect Discrimination in the Equality Act 2010, and it's, it's 19.2 I want to take you to. All of A, B, C, and D refer to it, and it is the uh, PCP that is being justified. It's not the, uh, the individual disadvantage of, what the, not the individual. Uh, where individual disadvantage comes under indirect, indirect discrimination is 19.2 C we say I've dealt with underground three. Now, I found it particularly helpful because justification is not the most straightforward of legal concepts in employment law to look at the most recent 
court of this court, the most recent decision of this court, uh, and it was the leading judgment of Lord Just Lady Justice Simler, and that's the Independent Workers Union against Mayor of London. And it does crystallise the analysis of the effect, certainly for myself, and I'm sure it's uh, of assistance to this court. So that's tab 35. That's authorities bundle two. summarise what those facts are about, my Lord. Uh, this was a judicial review complaint, though it concerned the application of indirect discrimination, section 19, uh, and it concerned whether the removal of the exemption of minicabs from the congestion charge, save for those that were designated for wheelchair use, amounted to indirect discrimination for BAME B -A -M -E drivers, female drivers and disabled passengers. So that's what the facts are about. But it's paragraph 77 I want to take you to. Say it's the most recent statement of this court on the law of uh, indirect discrimination, in particular justification. It's quite a long paragraph. Uh, I probably have time if you do, if you I do have time if you just read that paragraph, I'd be grateful. <coughs> yes. I maintain to summarise what uh, Lady Justice Simler, she then was, says. It, it, first point is proportionality, the terms proportion and justify often get mangled and they're used interchangeably, though they are different. And justification is divided into two elements. One is the legitimacy of the aim, the second is the proportionality stage. But you'll see from 77, the first, uh, uh, one, two, three, four, down, which as section 19D of the Equality Act makes clear, discriminator must show as proportionate means of obtaining a legitimate aim uh, in order to justify. That involves determining first whether the measure or PCP is directed at achieving a legitimate aim, and that's where you have reference to the real need, appropriate to achieving the objective, and reasonably necessary to achieve the aim. So you've seen those three expressions uh, uh, to the authorities of Homer and Selden and other authorities my learned friends taken to you. But you'll see that that test falls in the legitimacy of the aim element of the 
justification exercise. And the second test is when you get to proportionality. Now, when you get to, this is my third point, when you get to proportionality, that's if you look at us on page, that's over the page on 532. It says, further as is well settled, the test of proportionality is in essence a balancing exercise between the discriminatory effect of the measure of PCP on the disadvantaged groups and the needs of the employer. And it's, she references Lord Justice Mummery in the case of Elias. It's necessary to weigh the need against the seriousness of the detriment to the disadvantaged group. So, my Lord, it's not an error of law, I would say, to uh, assess the PCP as whether it's uh, proportionate, so that's the second stage of proportionality, against the uh, disadvantaged group rather than the individual. So, it's not an error of law, I would say, for the uh, tribunal to have done so. When you carry out the balancing exercise is at the end of the exercise, the end of the, 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 end of the justification exercise. That's when you carry out the, the weighing exercise. That, that, there's the reference of, I'll give it to you, uh, my Lord, in the case of Asta, that's Authorities Bundle 2, tab 24, page uh, 312, and that's where the ends and the means are balanced. But you do it at the end. Now, the reason I'm making the point about doing it at the end is because that's what we say the tribunal plainly did do. Now, What's the measure to be justified? That was a question you asked, Ms. Jolly. It's an important question. Uh, Ms. Jolly said it's, it is the framework. But it has to be, uh, this is what Mrs. Justice Edie found, it has to be the framework that was effectively applied in practice. Because that's, that's the thing when you come to proportionality, the balancing exercise, you'll look at what, whether, it was a reasonably, whether it was reasonably necessary. Uh, so we say, uh, it, in effect, it is the framework as applied flexibly in fact to applicants. It's not the abstract framework when you are considering justification. Now, Mrs. Justice Eady, my Lord, deals with this at paragraphs 177 and 178. I'm conscious I've only got eight minutes left, so I will just give you, or I can either take you to them or uh, or you can read them in due course, but they're effect effectively making that point. I'll, I will take you to it, actually. It's an yeah. important point. Page 100 of the core bundle, and it's at the bottom of that. It starts, CT plainly found the framework to be an appropriate means to achieve the aims identified, and went on to test whether it was reasonably necessary, permissibly taking into account the flexibility allowed for the framework. I'll just start off. Short second, I, 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 again, I couldn't put it better in terms of why the Employment Tribunal is correct in its analysis both of the legitimate aim element of justification and the balancing exercises. Uh, the uh, President puts it there. And I'd also ask you in, in due time to read paragraph 179 of that judgment. Just very briefly dealing in the headline terms. Well, the framework principle corresponded to a, a real need, a 
anything to meet academic standards of, of the university. And that, I'll give you the reference. That's paragraph 211 of the ET's judgment at CB 207. It was appropriate to achieve that objective because having meeting certain qualifications and standards would plainly achieve the requirement of uh, what they were seeking. And I'll give you the reference uh, to the I've got an EAT reference here. That's well, paragraph 187, core bundle 202. It was reasonably necessary to expect senior academics to have those body of qualifications and research, but you can't ignore, I say, the inherent flexibility around the PhD requirement. And I'll give you paragraphs at the ET 212, 213, 214, 217, and they're found at uh, core bundle 207 and 208. And I make the point that in, in my skeleton, this is the, those, the strict requirement of PhD and research requirement was not applied in practice, unlike the authority of games. Uh, as to the proportionality question, uh, if you look at ET paragraph 268, uh, it, uh, core bundle 218, uh, the tribunal uh, used the words, the framework was appropriate, reasonably necessary, and no more than reasonably necessary to achieve those aims. So plainly, my lord, they. they after they've made the findings of fact they've made, they then use the very, uh, sorry, the correct legal terms they were meant to use. And I'd also ask you to read the preceding paragraphs 268 to 271. And then finally, in respect to the balancing exercise, which seems to be the principal challenge that my learned friend was making, that they don't carry out the balancing exercise as they should have done, the second element of the proportionality test. I will take you to I say is the critical paragraph which uh, we say uh, strongly rebuts that ground or challenge. So that's it. Paragraph 271, core bundle 219. And it ought to, in fact, ought to, you can't ignore paragraph 270, but I'm conscious of time, my lord. I'd ask you to read 270, but 271 I will take you to. So we find that the university has shown these aims were legitimate and the means of achieving them was reasonably necessary, they were proportionate. And given the diversity of subjects and the consequent skill sets of staff, it is perhaps apt to adopt a in perfect metaphor from science to illustrate the point. The approach the university adopted was within the Goldilocks zone. That's obviously burning porridge and having uh, hot, uh, cold porridge. I think, porridge and getting I think porridge we know that. Right. <laughs> yes, I know. I, I, just, <laughs> I enjoy the yes. analogy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did think somebody Goldilocks was, but anyway, that's a, a different point. <laughs> the way the university balanced those competing objectives was just right. Any unfavorable treatment that there was was justified. Well, my lord, you, you have there a paragraph where the, the tribunal using the words balanced competing objectives and unfavorable treatment. So they've done the minimum, I would say, in terms of the, the balancing exercise. And you can't ignore either in this exercise uh, the fact reasonable adjustments, the fact that, the, uh, that there were no reasonable adjustments that uh, could have uh, alleviated the substantial disadvantage in, in another, in another uh, this other cause of action. So I'm conscious I've got three minutes, uh, or two don't, minutes perhaps, my lord. Don't, don't feel that you have to sit down on the dot of two falling times. Ms. Jolly had three and a quarter hours, so I'm sure she's not going to complain if you run a few minutes over. I'm grateful, uh, my lord. I will deal with the particular challenges then. The first, there were four challenges that uh, Ms. Jolly made. The, the first one is that the uh, tribunal uh, alluded legitimacy and proportionality, claimed they didn't on that analysis. The, the second one is uh, the failure to consider the particular disadvantage to the claimant at the justification test. Now, I've already dealt with the, the point that it was common ground that it was the PCP to be justified, not the individual treatment. You've got uh, two references, uh, one refer to authorities, one in uh, uh, Lady Hale, uh, I think she was Lady Hale then, in Selden, at paragraph 64 to 65, as referenced by the EAT at their paragraph 171, and that's core bundle 98 to 99. And also, uh, the, again, I'm relying on Griffiths quite uh, significantly, uh, Lord 
Crisis Elias at paragraph 27. We've already looked at that paragraph, but it's effectively requiring the same proportionality analysis. I think I've already, sorry, I've already made that point. In terms of this, the, the criticism in Buchanan that it was effect, well, the, policy, the framework policy is akin to a, a sickness management policy, that is dealt with by the EAT at paragraph 173 for bundle 99 to 100, and that provides the answer to this, that the framework's flexibility isn't a series of individual responses as you would have with a sickness management policy. I'm so sorry, could you just repeat that reference? Oh, apologies, my lady. Yes, no, it's, it's my fault. Uh, this is the EAT's analysis, which I uh, rely on. Are 173, that's a core bundle, 99 to 100, which is why framework's flexibility isn't akin to an attendance management policy. And then, actually, the, the slightly strange feature of this ground, my lord, is if you do consider the individual circumstances, it doesn't actually help him. Because, plainly, uh, if you're taking the, 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 dis, uh, the disadvantage, looking at the, sorry, the discriminatory impact on him, well, you have the no business case. You have the fact he wasn't engaging in the respondents' efforts to help him find an alternative pathway. And his reasonable adjustments were rejected, which were, and I think I haven't mentioned them, uh, there were two, well, effectively two, but they were described as three by the tribunal. That he wanted promotion outside the framework. That was rejected as not being reasonable. And he wanted to create a teaching only role for himself. Uh, again, that was uh, rejected as not being reasonable. So if you look at his individual circumstances, uh, the, the balance, the real need, the, the balance is in, 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 in the respondent's favour. But, uh, as Mrs. Justice Eady says, and the paragraph reference is here, EAT Para 179, Core Bundle 101, she said, I do not consider the ET lost sight of these circumstances. Uh, the claimant's individual position had been considered by the Employment Tribunal in detail. is correct to say that. So that deals with the second point. The third point, failing to afford due weight to all relevant factors. Well, my submission, the first one, is that's not what is required for a justification exercise. And the reference there is Lord Justice Pill, paragraph 32 of Hardy, which is Authority Bundle 1, tab 15, page 137. And it's the employer doesn't have to demonstrate that no other proposal is possible. The employer has to show that the proposal in this case for a full-time appointment is justified objectively, notwithstanding its discriminatory effect. But in any event, the tribunal plainly don't uncritically accept the respondent's justification for the for their framework, given the time they spent analysing it. And I would ask you to contrast the, the care with which they've <coughs> taken it, taken to uh, for example, a case like Allenby, where the tribunal only gave 15 uh, pages of written reasons. Now, uh, yes, yeah, so there are four factors now within that third element, failing to afford due weight to all relevant factors. Availability of less discriminatory alternative measures, extent to which the promotion would have compromised the achievement of respondents' legitimate aims, modest cost of promotion, teaching focus roles only exist, already existed, which required 20% of the role to be dedicated to research. And I effectively make the point, my Lord, that all four factors run up against the fundamental findings about a lack of business case for a particular role for claimant, claimant's refusal to engage with the respondent's attempts to find alternative pathways and the rejection of his reasonable adjustments uh, complain. And we say those four factors have simply been uh, uh, reframing, uh, reframing the adjustments that were sought and rejected. Just a couple of points on the modest cost of promotion. Well, that's, say, revisiting the issue of business case. Uh, and the tribunal have made their findings on that. And, and specifically, this criticism that there were teaching focus roles with only 20% research, well, that's not what the adjustment the, the, the claimant was seeking was a teaching only professional role without research. So it, that was rejected as reasonable. So it prefers to be perverse to expressly consider something rejected and was even uh, easier for uh, the claimant to do because there wasn't the research 
requirement. Because if you look at, uh, again, I'll just give the reference. This is the letter from the doctor at Beskeby Chambers that Ms. Shirley took you to right at the start. That's SB 93. What the adjustment that was being asked for was to a non-teaching university, sorry, a non-research university teaching role. So the point I'm making is that this is, seems to be a new, a new adjustment that was was sought. And there can't be any criticism to the tribunal in this regard. In any event, they rejected the uh, the easier uh, adjustment. So all these factors, reading at the judgment in this city, were, were considered by the tribunal. My Lord, is, is there anything? Come on, yeah. Trapped again. My gown is <laughs> a Harry Potter gown with a mischievous history. <laughs> uh, you were turning around to ask Mr. Johnson yeah. something, then do if you can do it. If I can do it without ripping my. <laughs> Great, my Lord. Is there, is there any. <laughs> is there any. <laughs> of his submission on ground one said that the central issue was what the effective reason was and he turned the court to um, the judgment of uh, Mrs Justice Simler she then was in Kneiser and, and uh, paragraph 31 and I simply want to invite the court to notice that there the test that uh, was set out by the EAT was an effective reason not the effective reason. And the important distinction between them is that an effective reason demonstrates that the test can bear more than one reason. It doesn't need to be sole. It's not the same as an unfair dismissal test. That's my first point. Uh, secondly, uh, I wanted to make a point on uh, the, uh, the business case itself and what my learned friend said on the business case. Um, <coughs> The first point to note is that he focused on the 29, on the evidence that the court had for 20, uh, 2019, sorry, 29, 2019, but not on the evidence on 2017 and 2018. And it's, of course, open to this court to find, if you're not with us on 2019, that nevertheless we are right on 2017 and 2018 in respect of the business case. My learned friend wasn't able to point to a uh, clear definition of what business case meant. In fact, in his own submissions, he elides budget and business case himself. And he didn't deal with my Lady, uh, uh, Lady Justice Lang's point that a budget working backwards can be provided when there's a good business case. And if you recall my point on that, how does a good business case get created? We say, at the very least in 2017 and 2018, even if you're not with us on 2019, the evidence that we took you to showed that it was about more than budget. It was about other factors that, through a, at least through a series of links, demonstrated a connection between the claimant's disability and his uh, uh, inability to meet the framework. Turning to grounds two and four, uh, my learned friend uh, took the court to the IWGB case and took the court to paragraph 77. I won't take the court to it now, but I would simply invite this court to look 
at the uh, summary of the authorities in paragraph 37, which in particular summarises the McCulloch case and Hardy and Hansen's that I referred to, and emphasises the role of the critical evaluation that the tribunal must take for itself when considering discriminatory impact and effect in proportionality. Related to that, uh, my learned friend um, took from uh, uh, the authority uh, the submission, it is not an error of law, he said, to uh, assess uh, whether the PCP is proportionate against the disadvantaged group rather than against the individual to test the discriminatory effect or uh, impact. And we say, I won't repeat my submissions on that, but we say even if that was true, there is no, uh, uh, there is no analysis or evaluation by the tribunal as it was required to do, of the disadvantage against the group, even, even, if you, even if you say it doesn't have to be against the individual, but we say for the reasons that we set out before. So we say that that submission doesn't work, because whether it's against the group or against the individual, there still has to be an analysis of that effect. And when you look at paragraphs 265 to 271, it's simply not there, or in any of the paragraphs to which it corresponds, simply not there. related under this ground, but on a separate point, uh, my learned friend uh, took uh, the court to Griffiths uh, and uh, uh, effectively made the submission that um, uh, it was uh, permissible for the tribunal to look at uh, reasonable adjustments in the context of proportionality. Uh, and to that end, I just would like to take the court very briefly, please, to um, the authority of Boyers, to which I uh, referred, which deals with uh, Griffith and that point. And Boyer, uh, Boyers is at tab 37 of the bundle, uh, at page 568. Are we on, are we on point four? Or? We are on point four. And at uh, paragraph 27. I'm so sorry, I haven't got it. Tab, which tab? It's tab 27, Department of Work and Pensions and Boyers. Sorry, 37. 37. 37. 30, I'm so sorry, my tabs are different on okay. electronic. 37. Yes. Uh, and it's, uh, the relevant paragraph is at 568. First of all, uh, if I could invite you to look at tw paragraph 23. The Supreme Court set out a structured four-stage approach to that balancing exercise in Ackerman. Uh, and it sets out there the four stages, including at four, the last line of the paragraph. Fourth, whether the steps are complained of strike <coughs> a fair balance between the need to accomplish the aim and the detriment suffered. At 24, in a dismissal case, the balancing exercise is not the same as a range of reasonable responses test. And then the, the critical point that I wanted to go to on Griffiths is at paragraph 27. Um, when conducting balancing exercise required by section 15, the employer is entitled to give weight to the fact that an employer did not make reasonable adjustments as required by section 20 and 21. That's the point I made uh, uh, before. But... Uh, the court goes on, the EAT goes on to say, uh, however, this does not mean, and he refers to, um, this does not mean that where a re reasonable adjustment cannot be made, the dismissal cannot still amount to discrimination within the meaning of section 15, as explained by Lord Justice Elias at paragraph 79 of Griffith. Um, so that deals with that point. 
Uh, and uh, the, my fifth point uh, also is on reasonable adjustments. Uh, and um, uh, and I say, and I, I made this point, but I'll make it slightly more clearly at this stage, that what, one of the reasons are. One of the reasons we say that you can't simply elide the reasonable adjustments test with the proportionality exercise that needs to be carried out is because of the different requirements. And one of the reasons, or perhaps the key reason why the reasonable adjustment test failed, is because of knowledge. And if one turns to the tribunal's findings at uh, Two, it's, it's findings at 205 of the bundle, which I think is at page uh, 206 of the bundle. At the, at the very last line of paragraph 205, in fact, just, just to give this some context, if you look at 203, you see this is the part of the judgment that deals with adjustments and knowledge. And then if you turn to 205, the last line says uh, the university had done what was reasonable to appraise itself of Mr. Pipe's medical position and the disadvantages it caused, and latterly he had failed to fully engage with that. We find neither the university neither knew nor had actual knowledge of the disability or, or of the disadvantage prior to September, October 2018, that is something that the EAT found was wrong. Uh, and that part of the <coughs> EAT's judgment is paragraphs 106 and 107 of the EAT's judgment, which you see at page 77 of the four bundle. And at 108, um, Mr. Justice Eady says that the point becomes academic, but had not had that not been the case, she would have allowed the ground of appeal. Yes. Uh, the, the, the point is effectively that that is, an, that is an, uh, a, a, a good illustration of why you can't simply read across from reasonable adjustments to proportionality. In this case, the reasonable adjustments that failed have already, um, have already uh, 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 not been able to surmount the knowledge hurdle, and that's, that's already happened. Whereas for proportionality, uh, the not, for example, knowledge of uh, disability, knowledge, knowledge of uh, medical, um, the substantial disadvantage isn't required, either for Section 15 or Section 19. So the state of the medical evidence uh, is a consideration for proportionality purposes, but it's not the end of the road. Uh, and so that simply illustrates why you can't read it and then my final point, if you could just bear with me, I just want to check with my junior. Students. Yes, of course. I'm so sorry, my, my, my lords and ladies. Could you just bear with me for of one course. final point, yes. just to find a reference for it? Yes. Thank you very much. I, I'm going to ask my learner junior to take the last point. Good. Thank you yes. very much. Mr. Jackson. <laughs> I've let down Mr. Johnson. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, my lords and my ladies. This point is going to address indirect age discrimination. And I would start by going to the ET judgment itself. So if I could go, I want you conscious of time, I will not be reading these paragraphs word for word, but if I could go to page 224 of the core bundle. Sorry, no, that's 
222 My Lord, what we see at 222, paragraph 286 is interesting in my submission. And for this records the respondent's concession that if group disadvantage was established in relation to age, that individual particular disadvantage would necessarily follow. And we see that at that final sentence, or the final plot, second final sentence. It was acknowledged that any arguments in relation to individual disadvantage mirrored those in relation to group disadvantage, such that if the tribunal found that there was a group disadvantage, it would inevitably conclude that Mr. Pike was placed at that disadvantage. We thus address them together. At 287, you see, my lord, the nature of the disadvantage alleged. Persons in that age range would be less likely to have a PhD. Persons in that age range would be less likely to try and obtain a PhD because of their proximity to retirement, very close to Homer. And consequently, persons in that group will have increased difficulty, or put another way, the reduced opportunity than younger groups in obtaining a PhD and achieving promotion to grade 7. Now, at paragraphs 290 to 293, which I'll not read through, the ET finds there was no group disadvantage because the flexibility in the framework, in other words, the fact that the requirement was to be on a pathway to PhD, and the fact that there were different kinds of PhDs that could be pursued, meant there was no group disadvantage. My Lord, if one then looks to Mrs. Justice Eady's judgment in the EAT, she upholds the claimant's ground of appeal that that was wrong. And the reason why, in Mrs. Justice Eady's view... You'd better show us if... Um, yes, my Lord. I'm going to ask Mr. Johnson after this to reply, because this is effectively a new point in simi with similar brevity. But sh show us uh, um, uh, what Mrs. Justice Eady says. Um, my Lord, that is at, at page 87 of the core bundle. Yes. And this is paragraph 139. Uh, the better point made by the claimant under ground 9 is that the ET effectively lost sight of the comparative exercise it was required to carry out. The issue was not whether all members of the older age group in question, 59 or 55 to 59, would necessarily suffer disadvantage by the application um, of the framework, but whether members of that group would thus be disadvantaged when compared to others who were not of that age, citing Homer. Uh, just as the impairment suffered by the claimant placed him at a comparative disadvantage, the application of the framework was considered in abstract terms, so too might those in the older age range be disadvantaged as compared to those who were younger. By the, prov by the provision within the framework allowing for progression for those who had or had the ability to obtain a PhD, and Mrs. Justice Eady concludes, I do not see that the flexibility, as the ED found, allowed under the framework would necessarily remove this potential comparative disadvantage if those who did not fall within the age of the older age group would be more likely to have a greater or would be more likely to have a greater number of routes to progression available, a comparative disadvantage would seem to arise. And then by focusing on how the claimant and others in the same age cohort might obtain progression by alternative routes, the ET failed to consider the potential disadvantage arising from the greater range of options available to those in younger cohorts. Um, so, my lord, where does that leave us with individual disadvantage, given the respondent's
Britain's concession, rightly, that that would necessarily correspond to the group disadvantage that we see recorded in the ET judgment at paragraph um, 286. Um, my final point on this, and I appreciate this has taken some time, is that that concession made by the respondent was made for good reason. The group disadvantage was the reduced likelihood of promotion. The claimant fell within the group at a reduced likelihood of promotion. And therefore the claimant had the relevant individual particular disadvantage, which again was the reduced likelihood of promotion. His disadvantage corresponded with that of the group. And um, um, Mrs. Jolly KC earlier referred to ESSIP, paragraph 31 from memory, and then Ryan, um, several paragraphs between paragraph 55 and I think 69, which focuses on cases where that disadvantage is reduced likelihood and what the implications of that are. Um, my lords, my lady, uh, those are my submissions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Johnson. Uh, my lord, the, the response from the respondent is, is a relatively straightforward one, which is this is not something which was relied upon in the grounds of appeal. Um, it is not something that was put to you in submissions in, in the first instance either. It is something which is being raised for the first time um, in submissions in rebuttal to um, submissions that were made by um, a learned uh, leader. Uh, yes, we can see that. Um, the, Mrs Justice Eady says she would have allowed the appeal on the ground nine, but this is academic given her conclusion on justification. Yes. Where, where is her conclusion on justification? Um. Paragraph 